Welcome to the state of Ohio. I'm Karen Kassler. Eclipse excitement is reaching its apex on the way to the big event on Monday, when about 124 miles of western and northern Ohio will be in total darkness for as long as almost four minutes when the moon will appear to completely cover the sun. The total solar eclipse is Ohio's first since 1806, when the state was three years old. There won't be another one visible in Ohio until 2099. The reception to this once in a lifetime event has been huge. Hotel rooms and restaurants across Ohio are booked. State parks are sold out. School districts have canceled classes and tens and maybe hundreds of thousands of vehicles could jam city streets, highways and state routes. Communities in the path of totality have been preparing for more than a year. The eclipse is one of a series of big events in Cleveland. The NCAA Women's Basketball Championship is 24 hours before the eclipse. And the sold out home opener for the Cleveland Guardians starts a little over a half an hour after it. Cuyahoga County emergency and safety experts say it's not going to be a normal day. As you can imagine, in a county like ours, uh, there's a lot of different police and fire uh, departments and service departments and all sorts of entities that uh, have to be connected and communicating uh, during a large special event. So a lot of a lot of our work is focused on ensuring that, that coordination is going to exist. Did you consult with other big cities that have hosted something like this? Were there certain events that have happened in Cleveland that have helped you figure out what you want to do? Yes, uh, you know, uh, we, we were fortunate that um, the city of Nashville experienced a very similar event in 2017. Uh, and they're obviously a comparably you know, sized um, urban area to ours. And so they were able to share some of their lessons learned and experiences from the event. Um, primarily, you know, what they what they focused on was uh, that A, they likened it to hosting a large special event like the NFL draft or, or another type of event that you've, you know, been accustomed to seeing in, in the Cleveland area. Um, and, you know, they talked to us about uh, some of the traffic congestion issues that they experienced that you would expect out of a large special event with the, you know, um, a large volume of people coming to an area. They also talked about uh, momentary communications issues sometimes uh, in, in areas uh, either had pockets of, you know, densely populated pockets of, uh, you know, people, um, uh, which again is something that that we're accustomed to here. Uh, you know, you go to a Browns game or or the, uh, you know, uh, Cavs championship parade in 2016. Uh, people are familiar with that occasionally occurring. Are you preparing for just a lot of traffic and crowds or is there a real concern about emergencies that could happen when you bring a large number of people together all at once? Uh, I mean, I, our focus, I think, our, is, is mostly on the, the traffic and crowds. We're trying to um, ensure that, you know, the areas that are hosting watch parties um, are equipped uh, and, and, and able to you know, share information. We have good visibility on what's occurring there. Uh, and then in the event that, um, you know, there would be an issue uh, that would potentially happen somewhere that, uh, again, we're going to have our emergency operations center uh, activated. We've gone through our planning process, uh, um, you know, uh, over the course of this year, we have all of our stakeholders and partners uh, plugged into that. Um, and, you know, we feel confident that we're going to be able to react to, you know, if there is a traffic issue or some other disruption, we'll be able to react to that and, and, um, and respond the way we need to. 80%, 90% of emergency management's job is before the emergency or before the event and planning for it and preparing. And so we've been doing this a long time, trying to mitigate the risk or what could happen that day. We all hope that nothing is going to happen that day. But what people may not realize is there's a there's a whole room operating in the background the day of um, of the eclipse. And it's as Mark mentioned, it's all of our stakeholders and all of us trying to make sure that public safety is as prepared as possible. But that we and we've been doing the work. But if there is an emergency that we can work together and we can quickly mitigate that emergency. And finally, I, I know the weather is the wild card here that we haven't even talked about. It's it's hard to predict the weather in Ohio <laughs> in April. Uh, I guess final advice here, if people want to go to a specific site, say Great Lakes Science Center, Edgewater Park, how should they plan to get there and how early? Well, I think, yeah, you have to, I would encourage people to watch the news, watch the traffic, you know, all the, all the different apps and, and Google Maps you have now will show you uh, pretty, uh, you know, reliably uh, well information on, on traffic conditions. Um, and so, um, you know, if you're, if you're going to, uh, if you're planning to go to a certain area that is hosting a watch party, I'd recommend uh, reaching out to that area as far as if whatever the community it's in, um, you know, the local stakeholders are going to have the best information about potential road closures and other, you know, issues to avoid that day. Um, so I just, I think informing yourself as best you can about, you know, if there's an endpoint, if there's a location that you're, that you're going to try to get to, um, 
you know, thinking through the route you're going to take to get there and making sure that you have the best information uh, from that location about what to expect day of. And, and what's your weather prediction here? I mean, <laughs> if you, if you, I imagine you're watching the weather pretty carefully as a lot of people who are hoping to experience this eclipse are. Absolutely, yeah. And so, you know, Brandy's mentioned, our, you know, the stakeholders, one of those uh, is, is the National Weather Service, and they are already providing uh, regular forecast updates for the actual, you know, April 8th date. Um, the last one that I saw, you know, it, it talked, you know, had a lower percentage of uh, precipitation expected, but there was some cloud cover expected. Uh, they, you know, they caveat that with this could change, you know, obviously 10 more times uh, <laughs> leading up to the event. So who knows? I think, you know, the, the day of is going to be the best indicators as to what the weather's going to look like. Brandy, want to add anything? Um, I would just add that making sure in addition to per personal preparedness that people remember, see something, say something, you know, look around, there's a lot of people and the majority of people have best intentions for an event like this. But if something doesn't look right, you know, say something to a law enforcement officer or someone else, like especially for if a, a teenager or a kid making sure that that they find an adult or someone that they can talk to. One of the things the sheriff always likes to tell the little kids is, or the family is when you're going out for that day, since there are large events, put your phone number on your child's arm in case they are to get lost or away from you. So we want to make sure none of those things happen, but just remember that they could. And so that personal preparedness is, again, so important. Officials are also reminding drivers that it's not safe to stop on freeways to see the eclipse. There were problems with drivers doing that during the last total solar eclipse in the U.S. in 2017.